everybody to this um, um, webinar for the International Collaborative for Best Care for the Dying Person. Um, the title of the webinar is Advanced Care Planning Worth Advancing. Um, we're going to have two distinguished speakers today, Professor Sean Morrison and Associate Professor Juliet Jacobson um, joining us um, to talk about advanced care planning. Um, often advanced care planning, I think, feels like a simple thing, but I think the more we get into the concepts of advanced care planning, the more we reach into the world of complexity. Um, before we start, we just mention a little bit about the International Collaborative. We have over 177 members from around the globe. And our vision is a world where all people experience a good death as an integral part of their individual life, supported by the very best personalized care. I've lost my. So what do we do? Um, we do research and development, we do learning and teaching, and we do quality assurance. And um, at the heart of that is an international collaborative 1040 model for best care for the dying person, which um, informs documentation to inform care at the patient's bedside. So we're now going into um, our um, talks. And I think if you need um, to think of any questions, please put them in the chat function. And it's with great pleasure that I introduce Professor Sean Morrison. Um, and he's going to talk on following the science, the lessons of advanced care planning. So over to you, Sean. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, and ah, there we go, share screen. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, and unfortunately, I guess for those um, in the southern continent, good evening. And um, thank you so much for the opportunity <coughs> um, to um, speak today and to talk a little bit about sort of um, how the science of advanced care planning is and I think where we go next. And I'm really pleased to be on with Juliet because I think she's got some really terrific ideas about where we go next. Um, just before I start, I want to acknowledge uh, three people who have really helped think through this, through this issue with me and are equally responsible for um, many of the slides and the views you're going to see. James Tulsky, Bob Arnold, and Diane Meyer. So I just want to begin by saying where I come to this from and how my thinking has evolved. And this is the, actually the very first research paper that I ever published and the first research that I ever did as a um, trainee back in 1992 that looked at physician reluctance to discuss what at that time had not involved, evolved into advanced care planning but were advanced directives. And over the course of my early research, I did a lot of work and a lot of research focused on first um, advanced directives, then the process of advanced care planning, trying in many respects to develop the evidence base to demonstrate that having discussions in advance with people um, of all stages of illness improved end of life care. And as the time has evolved and 25 years have passed, I've come to myself the conclusion that the science doesn't really support advanced care planning as we currently define it. And sort of the culmination of that research journey was this um, op-ed in JAMA in the fall that I co-authored with Diane and Bob entitled What's Wrong with Advanced Care Planning, which I think bought me the ticket uh, to present to you today. Um, so I just want to begin to make sure that we are all on the same page because what I have learned 
over the past six months is there is both confusion and in many respects differences of opinion about what advanced care planning is um, what it was and what it could evolve into. But I really want to sort of start so we're all on the same page with both the historical definition and when you look at the consensus documents, what advanced care planning really is. Um, and first of all, to begin with the goal. Um, and the goal of advanced care planning historically and for most right now is to ensure goal concordant care near the end of life for patients who lack decisional capacity. And it is a process to support adults in understanding and sharing their values, goals, and preferences regarding future potential medical care decisions. Um, and it includes really four things. One is choosing and preparing a trusted person to make medical decisions. The second is preparing for future conversations conversations about future treatments, the inclusion of goals and values within those conversations, and then for many documenting those wishes or communicating those wishes so that they can be acted upon when needed. And there are still certain things that are produced from that process. Um, one is the healthcare proxy or durable power of attorney for healthcare or a named surrogate. The second is a treatment director or advanced directive. The third is simply a clinician documented conversation in the medical record. Um, and then the fourth most recently is a physician order for life sustaining treatment or also known as a medical order for life sustaining treatment. And I want to be very clear what advanced care planning is not. Um, advanced care planning is not in the moment decision making, nor is it the conversation that we have with people living with serious illness, life threatening illness, or near end of life about what are their values and goals or what are the real time, real decisions that need to be made in the setting of that illness. Those are not decisions really being made in advance. Um, they're not potential decisions, they're real decisions, um, and they're not hypothetical. And I would also argue that the way that it is framed right now, it's not a palliative care intervention because the focus really is on speaking in many respects with people who are either A, healthy, B, living with chronic illness, and C, speaking with people for whom this is going to be potential decisions way off in the future. Um, and. Advanced care planning is attractive, um, and I think that's why so many of us feel so strongly about it, because conceptually it makes sense. Um, it honors patient autonomy and self-determination, and importantly allows the current self to dictate outcomes of the future self when that person may not be able to speak for themselves. Um, it has the potential for reducing low-value care. It has the potential to reduce decision-making conflict and it has the potential to reduce burdens on caregivers and surrogates. So let's turn to the evidence base because I think this is where, and this is truly what led me to the article that I published in the um, fall and led my co-authors to that conclusion. We've got a lot of research on advanced care planning, um, a lot. If we look at the period of time from 1990 to 2021, there are over 6,000 peer-reviewed articles on ACP, and indeed, over 94 to 2017, there are 80 systematic reviews of advanced care planning, um, including you know almost 2,000 studies. And to put that in perspective for palliative care, that's one and a half times the number of studies on delirium treatment, eight times the number of breathlessness studies on breathlessness, and 15 times the number of studies on cancer pain treatment for children. Um, there was a recent scoping review which looked at more um, high quality advanced care planning, um, 69 studies, and then just in the past two years, I'm sorry, that should be 2020 to 2022, there have been six multi-site well-designed randomized control trials. 
And if we look at all of that evidence um, together, what we can find is that there, are, there is very strong evidence that we can improve knowledge of advanced directives and advanced care planning among a number of people. We can get people to complete a document. We can get medical professionals to document an, their advan an advanced directive in the medical record. And most recently, we, that we can increase the rate of advanced care planning discussions that occur between patients and their physicians. What we have not been able to demonstrate consistently, um, and yes, you know, you can find an occasional article that has a trend or perhaps an outcome, but when we look at that entire body of work, we cannot find consistent evidence that advanced care planning improves concurrent coordinates between patients and surrogates, that it influences real-time medical decisions at the end of life, that it enhances goal concordant care, that it improves patient or family perceptions of quality of care, or that it improves satisfaction or reduces anxiety around decision making at the end of life. <clears throat> and I would postulate that ACP's failure represents the gap between hypothetical scenarios and real world decision making in a way that we just probably aren't going to be able to close. And why is that? So let's look at what's needed for advanced care planning to succeed. First of all, patients need to be able to articulate their values and goals and identify what treatments would align with those goals in hypothetical future scenarios, or at least be able to identify how their values and goals would identify at least a treatment approach. Those wishes need to be documented and shared with the surrogate. Surrogates need to invoke substituted judgment to make those treatment decisions when needed. Clinicians will need to be able to honor those preferences and decisions. And I think really importantly right now, health systems and society will support that goal concordant care. The challenge is though, is that the scenarios and situations that we encounter in true clinical practice rarely reflect these ideal conditions. First of all, treatment decisions near the end of life, they are not simple, they're not logical, they're rarely linear, they're rarely autonomous, and they're not predictable. Instead, they are complex, they are uncertain, they are socially determined, they are emotionally laden, and they are fluid, they are not fixed. Preferences are rarely static, and we know now that they're influenced by a number of different things all of which change over time. We now know that surrogates find it really difficult to extrapolate specific treatment decisions from distant general ACP discussions. They find it difficult to piece together what their loved one would have wanted and in the process of doing that, disentangle their own preferences, their emotions, and feelings of guilt from the decision at hand I've so often sat with a family member who says, I know what my mom would want, and yet I can't do that because it means losing my mother. Um, and it is really, really difficult to challenge those of us in white coats who recommend different treatments. And treatment decisions don't occur in a vacuum. We know that they are driven by financial incentives in the marketplace, societal capacity to support patient need, and institutional, regional cultures and practice patterns. That this idea that a conversation, or more importantly, a series of conversations can overcome everything in the environment and direct goal concordant care, I think is perhaps optimistic at best and naive at worst. And so why, despite what I would argue is a fairly strong body of evidence to the contrary, why does advanced care planning persist? Um, well, first of all, it's the ethically correct thing to do. It is the ideal respect for persons and autonomy. Um, have some have said advanced care planning is not the problem, it's our health system, and if we change the health system, advanced care planning would work. Um, well, I'm not so sure that that's an easy thing to do. 
As human beings, we have a fundamental need to believe that we can control what happens to us, and sometimes, you know, we just can't. Um, there's commitment bias in this, like any area of research. There is confirmation bias in this, like any other research. Um, and I think particularly for Western societies, there is really a difficulty accepting the limits of autonomy as determinative of our life course. And finally, you know, what I've heard a lot recently is it's better than nothing and Sean, give us an alternative approach. Um, and I, I know Juliet's going to talk about that. Um, and why not continue? Um, what's the harm? Well, I think there is some harm. Um, Darren Highland in Canada has done some recent research that has discovered that the poor communication skills that characterize current ACP because most of us in practice have never learned the important communication skills that are a core component of palliative care, that those poor communication skills can lead to both gold discordant and suboptimal care. We have a limited workforce, limited clinical dollars, limited resources, and limited research dollars. And the efforts devoted to advanced care planning must come at the expense of addressing other important needs of the, serious Ill, of the seriously ill. Um, we're making a false agreement with our patients because we're promoting, and I'm not sure the myth is the right word, I should have substituted that, but we're promoting the idea with our patients that engaging in advanced care planning will prevent future undesired treatment. And we know that that's just not the case. Um, and I would argue that in some circumstances, and we certainly saw this in COVID, that the presence of an advanced care planning discussion in the medical record or the presence of a written treatment directive impeded real-time high-quality discussions between a patient, between a surrogate, and a treating healthcare provider because they were relying on what had happened in the past. Um, and certainly in the stress, the time pressures, the immense suffering that we saw in COVID in New York, the presence of a MOLS post or advanced directive was a godsend to our emergency physicians because it meant that they didn't have to talk to the patient and they could move on to the next person. And sometimes, sometimes those patients, and many times, those patients had the capacity to talk to them about what they would want in that setting. Um, and those discussions did not happen because of the presence of that document or the presence of that medical note. Um, so let me conclude just with some alternatives. What should we be doing? Um, I don't think we should be throwing everything out of advanced care planning. I think it is critical, critical, critical that we focus on having people appoint a trusted surrogate because it is much better for somebody that we trust and we love to make decisions for us than a stranger. I really think that we need to focus on improving in the moment, real time, shared decision making because the data suggests we do a very poor job of that. And we don't have a strong evidence base to tell us how should we approach decision making with seriously ill patients when the decisions need to be made. What information do they want? What's the unit of decision making? Is it themselves? Is it their family? Do they want the clinician to make that decision? What are the things that should go into those conversations? I think it's reasonable to think about can we prepare people for having conversations without engaging in the content? Um, the prepare, Rebecca Sudori at University of California, San Francisco's prepare model and others, which is really focused on sitting with seriously ill patients and again, preparing but not engaging the content. And um, perhaps controversial, the most controversial is should we incorporate a best interest standard into decision making for people at the end of life and balance, be able to balance patients' goals and values, cultural their cultural, religious, and personal preference with what is medically in the patient's best interest. And I understand the risks of going down that path. Um, but it does seem to me that at some point, we really need to balance societal good with individual autonomy, because I suggest that the pendulum um, towards autonomy swung quite, quite far. 
And I would just conclude by saying, you know, this is not a failure. Um, that the history of advanced care planning really is the ultimate model of science working. We develop a hypothesis. We pilot test it. We test it again. We examine the data. We draw conclusions, and then we move forward. And I would suggest that this is an idea that we shouldn't look at this as a failure of, you know, what some have said to me: Are you saying we should throw out everything we've done over the past 20 years? Absolutely not. We should build on what we know. Um, so let me stop there. Um, and um, really curious to hear what Juliet has to say. Um, thank you very much, Sean. That was. Um very interesting and also um, provoking as well. Um, I just must apologize for not introducing you correctly, but I, I lost my screen early on. Um, so I will introduce you now in retrospect, Sean. I'm, <laughs> because I'm just, uh, you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Sean is the um, Ellen and Howard Katz Professor and Chair of the Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine, ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and Director of the National Palliative Care Research Centre. Um, he's also Co-Director of a National Palliative Care Centre, um, and he's really devoted to increasing the evidence base of palliative care in the United States, and his work has appeared in major peer-reviewed medical and policy journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, Health Affairs and the Journal of the American Medical Association. And I think we've um, seen that aptly demonstrated with your um, talk and presentation, Sean. So thank you for that. And um, I think we've nothing in the chat. I think the introduction there um, gives the depth of your, your knowledge. And I, from my perspective, a very interesting um, overview and summary linked with the, the evidence base around advanced care planning and just those three words can mean so much to different people and different cultures and care settings. Um, and I think, as you say, it's not about not, not about dis not throwing it out. It's about really distilling out about how it, the efficacy, what is relevant, um, helpfully effective within our healthcare settings. Um, please do put some questions in the chat, please, um, for the end of the presentations. I think this dovetails very nicely into our next speaker, Associate Professor Juliet Jacobson. Um, Juliet is Associate um, Professor at the Harvard Medical School and researcher at the Lund University Institute for Palliative Care, where she works by um, um, a number of our colleagues in the International Collaborative, including uh, Professor um, Carl Johann Fust. Um, Juliet is a palliative care clinician, educator, in, interested in communication system change and the psychology of, of adaptation to serious illness. Um, she's worked at the Massachusetts General Hospital for 16 years. And again, of um, interest to um, people within the collaborative and here at the webinar is that Juliet has worked on the continuum project um, looking at the improving the delivery of generalist palliative care through the implementation of the Serious Illness Care Programme. And Juliet, I think you're aware, but um, other members of the collaborative may not be aware that this is one of the focuses perhaps of a, a collaborative taking forward a research programme about the Serious Illness Care Programme. And I like to think of it as promoting conversations with patients. I, I think we we distinguish our, our distinguish we distinguish between this and advanced care planning. But I'm I'll be interested to see how you um, interpret that. So, yeah. um, Juliet, over to you. And very welcome. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Can you see my screen? All right. Great. Yeah. So I'm going to be talking about the shift that I think we're feeling that we need. We're, we're all trying to solve the same problem, right? We see our patients and our families struggling. Um, end of life is difficult. And the question is, how do we help? How do, how do we help best? And um, to all of the work that Sean is doing, how do we you know, make sure that the time that we spend our lives doing this work, that it's meaningful? We don't wanna do things that, that aren't um, making change. And so as I've been thinking about this, this problem for a while, I, I get some comfort from Martin Luther King um, with his idea of the, the long arc, um, the arc of the moral universe being long and, and bending towards justice. 
and I, and I and I kind of wonder if maybe the arc of clinical care and culture change and palliative care is hopefully bending towards improvement. And I, I have some hope for this. And I'll, I'll tell you a short story. When I first started working at Mass General, I'd get these consults for dyspnea and walk into these rooms of patients in extremis, really actively dying with, with terrible symptoms that they'd had for days. And so it got to the point where when I get that consult, I'd have this, this feeling of urgency. And sometimes the stairs, I would, sometimes I'd feel like, I, like the elevator wasn't fast enough because I just had this sense that um, there were patients out there that could, that could be that, um, that sick. And maybe about, I was trying to figure out this when this changed. It changed slowly. And I think some of the change was due to the early integration work uh, that Jennifer Temmel did with our lung oncologists. But somewhere in the last decade, five years, I've stopped having that feeling that I need to run when I get those patients. And sometimes I'll have lunch because I, it never happens. These patients have conversations early. They get their symptoms treated. The goals are clear. I never walk into rooms with actively dying patients um, with terrible Daryl will just me anymore. And so there's, there's something that's happened, but it's happened over a long time. And it would be hard to measure on a day-to-day -day basis, right? It was a, a slow change. And I think we have examples of these slow changes. These are just two other ones that I found. You know, when you look at hospice use in the United States, it's, it's increasing. Now half of our patients, um, Medicare patients are enrolled and the median day has gone up from 54 to 86. And it, it's not perfect and there's lots of people who aren't, but overall we're, we're seeing a shift, which indicates that perhaps patients are having conversations earlier and making slightly different decisions. Thinking about the data in Europe, I think another way to experience this shift is looking at guidelines and pathways. This was a study that looked at 60 guidelines and 14 pathways, and 80% of those emphasized holistic approach to palliative care, meaning palliative care integrated with oncology care early in the course of treatment. And we all know that that, that approach wasn't around 20 years ago, and now it's in these guidelines. So over this longer period of time, we're, we're seeing this arc of change. And so I think the question for all of us is, is how do we contribute to that the best way? What's, what is the most efficient ways to, to bend the care towards quality care? And I think this is difficult and, and um, I, I, I loved how you did this, Sean. I think we're both tackling the same problem of trying to um, talk about the complexity of the, of the decisions that face our patients and um, where advanced care planning fits in all of this. Um, this is my conceptualization of, of this patient in the beginning of illness. And this patient's got several things to do. They have to make a lot of medical decisions and they also have to figure out how to live and cope with their illness. They're gonna be busy. And the decisions include decisions around diagnosis and first treatments. And then there's more information shared and your prognosis gets worse. And then there's more treatment decision-making and shared decision. And maybe you figured out how long you have and where you wanna be. Are you gonna be at home or try more treatment? And finally, you're thinking about end of life. Um, but it's a series of complex decisions and most of them are in the moment and they happen over and over and over again, over time. And I think sometimes people confuse advanced care planning with all of this other communication work that needs to be done when patients have serious illness. And then the other things that patients have to do is, is figure out how to cope with illness. And this comes out of our early um, integrated palliative care work when we just looked at the outcomes and the processes, and we talked to clinicians and patients and read all these transcripts and tried to think of, you know, what are patients doing in this time and, and how can we help them? And we've conceptualized it as, as five challenges, that patients are in this developmental process of, of figuring out how to live and eventually die from an illness. And the first part is just adapting to the diagnosis. You know, your, your life isn't the same, even though we all know we're dying at some point, when that point becomes a little bit clearer, um, it changes how we live. And so patients are adapting to that change. And then they're trying to figure out how to still be hopeful, right? How to, how to still have a forward orientation and um, prepare, you know, so Rebecca's work is about preparing, but we want to balance that with, with hopefulness. They want to live, they want to live normally. And there's some great qualitative work coming, uh, I think out of Agnes's group that just looks at how much people just want normal lives. Um, but they're getting sicker and they're starting to think about what their prognosis is again, and eventually acknowledging end of life. So there's a lot that our patients are doing. 
And it's, it's not really surprising that a conversation or two or a, an intervention that's, that's time limited early in the disease, you can see this guy's kind of just after diagnosis, that's trying to impact outcomes way down here, you know, when this, this person's gonna change, who they are is gonna change and they're gonna make multiple decisions in, in between. It's, it's not so that surprising that, it, that we're not finding those outcomes, you know, now that we think about it. Uh, and, but the good news is, I think it's, it's just Sean's fault. We don't have to throw it all away. It, 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 this can be useful to some degree. We know that when people have a conversation, they feel less anxious and worried. And Randy Curtis has written beautifully about this process in his, his own illness. Um, but the conversations that come from advanced care planning have value. Um, I think it's just hard to measure that value so far downstream with, with really um, very hard utilization outcomes. The other thing we've learned is with early palliative care, and that's this model at the bottom, it's really a model of lots of conversations, right? And lots of times when someone feels a little bit better, maybe for a little while and, and feels supported and less alone in this journey. And we know that when we do that over time, at least for the early part of illness, people report an improved quality of life and that they're feeling better. And I think we're nudging utilization outcomes with some of these interventions. It's not strong. Um, but there's some signal there that we may be changing how, how people make decisions. And so then the question becomes, well, how do we do this more? If, if, if we believe this is helpful for people and it, it addresses this complex system that they're in, how do we help clinicians do this more, have more meaningful conversations that are high quality? And that's where we, you know, in our institution, we chose a serious illness care program. There's other programs that also do this, like Final Talk. But we were trying to teach many more clinicians to have higher quality conversations throughout illness, at the beginning, at the middle, and at the end. The nice thing about this program is it uses a guide, which is a very efficient way to teach clinicians skills. It's also open source, which lets programs adapt it. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we've adapted ours. There's training that's involved with this program, and then there's systems change to try and make those conversations uh, more visible within the healthcare system. So I mentioned we adapted the program a little bit. We, we did three big changes and I'm just gonna talk about them briefly because it gets to this question of, of culture change and of, of where we, where we wanna be. And one of the things we added was this idea, it's really teaching clinicians about a theory of mind for patients and families and how patients and families are experiencing, experiencing and living with illness. And the way we do this, we show a short video, it has a patient talking about his illness. And as he talks, he has these times that he's really hopeful. He's like hoping for 20 years, even though he's metastatic lung cancer. He's hoping this can be managed like a chronic disease, like maybe it's really like diabetes. And then interspersed with those hopes, there's moments where you can really see um, that he understands, right? He's, he's like contacted a lawyer, he's sad, he's planning this big trip with friends. And, and the point of all of this is to help clinicians see that the mind, and this is all of our minds, I think, um, the mind just has different parts to it. Right? And we have hopeful parts and we have worried parts and those parts talk at different times. And it can be a little confusing if you don't understand the different parts. But sometimes we hear that hopeful part talking about the 20 years and we think that's truth, that patient's in denial, they don't understand. And really there's a worried part there too, that if you give a few minutes might speak also. And so this theory of mind helps clinicians approach patients for conversations. And that, that's really its value. I want our clinicians to feel comfortable having conversations and initiating conversations. And to do that, they really have to understand how patients cope with illness. So that's the first change that we made. A second adaptation, and this one, I can't say how valuable this one's been. If I you know I've, I'm taking a break from Mass General, but this is like one of the things I'm the most happy about with our whole program. And it's this idea of um, scholars or champions. So we've sent, we send like 12 people a year to PSEP, which is this two week training course in palliative care. And these clinicians are nurses, you know, interprofessional nurses, doctors, social workers from all of these different specialty areas where we want to encourage culture change. And what they get is they get a few more skills and they get an identity as a palliative care clinician or as a palliative care champion. And it's so much easier for us to have culture change when there's someone internal leading it. And so Erin, who's the girl front right, is a, a cardiologist. And 
you know, we were pushing string and cardiology for so many years, trying to get them to have conversations. And it matters a lot that Aaron stands up and says, we don't do this well. We're not, our patients are dying without any conversations. We're too late. Like when Aaron says it, it counts. And when I say it, it, it sounds like criticism. And so these champions have really um, been a big part of, of this, this program for us. And then the other change we made is we, ch we changed the guide a little bit. And it actually gets to what we wrote about in, in JAMA with that four-step process for communication. I think of this as like an everywhere conversation. I'm always having a variation of this four-step conversation. And what I like about it is it grounds the conversation what the patient understands and what the patient's values are, and then an honest prognostic disclosure and a recommendation. And so we changed our guide so that this is a little bit more central and we, we pulled out some of the goals and values questions. And so we encourage clinicians to use this conversation for all of their conversations, you know, whether they are in the clinic and it's early, what we might have called an advanced for planning conversation, or really for in-the-moment decision making much later on. And the advantage of using the same structure everywhere is, is people might remember it. Another way that we've tried to help people remember it is we built it into our documentation template. So when we first designed this, and this is where people put their conversations so that they can be tracked and we can find them and other people can find them and teach the ER to look for them. And we structured this with, with the different parts of the conversation. So you can see here's the four that are um, the most central, the patient's illness understanding, the prognostic information, their values and recommendations. And so I always thought this was good because it kind of makes it easier to document a complex conversation. You can just put the pieces of information into the box. And we have some check boxes even make it really simple. And then what I realized over time is that it's actually a really good teaching tool because I, you know, for our training, it's two and a half hours. Now it's one and a half hours on Zoom. It's not a lot of time to teach someone a new skill. But then what happens every time they document is they're reminded of the conversation structure, right? And so maybe they forgot to ask about hopes and worries this time, but they might remember next time because they can see that there's some boxes here and they, people like being able to fill out boxes. So my goal has been to train people and then if I can just get them to do it enough, I think that actually the documentation template continues to train them. And then we track these conversations over time. So this is um, three conversations that happened um, 2017, 18, and 19. This is a primary care doctor who's doing this regularly with this patient. And what I like about this is it, it's a message of a process, right? It's not about, these conversations aren't about find, finding truth. These conversations are about um, being in the moment with somebody, understanding where they are now, putting that down somewhere so somebody else doesn't do the exact same thing tomorrow, um, but then letting this information inform care slowly over time. And so I think having it look like a process to clinicians helps get at some of what John was talking about, where you have this sense of, oh, I don't need to have this because you've done this before. Hopefully our clinicians are learning that actually we do need to know what your values are today um, because we're gonna be making a decision today. Um, and I have some sense of what they've been over time, but this is an, this is an iterative process. I wanna just make sure I, I'm gonna go through these last ones quickly just so we have some time to talk. There's, there's outcomes associated with this program. They're not hard outcomes. They're process outcomes related to quality of conversation and timing of conversation and mood in patients and families. And I kind of think of this as we want to make sure we're going in the right direction. We don't want to do an intervention that has no benefit, but if it's a smaller intervention that's more related to the patient experience in the moment or the quality of the conversation in the moment, I, for me, that's enough noise to keep going in this direction. We also have some evidence that there's less cost with some of these conversations, which as we try to think about the value of care and the quality of care, I think is also helpful. And again, one more point in the right direction. With our program at Mass General, we're also asked like, how are you evaluating this, this program? And we, we started five years ago and we had some vague sense that um, we may do a kind of a pre-post at kind of institutional utilization outcomes. And now we've had a pandemic and that seems silly. But I think it's the bigger issue is how do you measure something that's happening over 10 years reliably? And I think it's very difficult. We've started um, looking mostly at process outcomes related to clinicians trained, the conversations we've had, are people doing this regularly, even number of quality improvement projects. There's a publication that in, a, in kind of quality improvement literature that just counts projects as progress, you know, because people are 
trying to make their area better and, I, and um, trying to show some improvement, even if it's not a published project. And then we've done some controlled studies. We did one in hospital medicine and we've done some qualitative research as well. Again, to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. This is just a snapshot of some of our data. Um, where our clinicians trained, it's now around 2000. And you can see it's really an interprofessional program. There's physicians, nurses, residents, uh, social workers, lots of different people participating and document, which is key. So then the second graph is conversations documented and we're back, I think we're at 20,000 now, but also documented by lots of different members of the care team. And we're still formulating, how do we think about this over time? So this is data um, from our, my the Swedish team that I joined here. So this was a chart review of about 250 patients and all the conversations they had kind of from diagnosis until end of life. And what we did is we graphed this. So every horizontal line is a patient and we graphed it by time. And we, we chose somewhat arbitrarily these time intervals. We, we tried to match it with clinical care. So the first is the time interval of days. So 14 days before death when really you're having a conversation about end of life and, and helping someone understand that they're at the very end of life. The next interval is months, and that's a different conversation. That's shared decision-making. Should we do more treatment? Should we not? You know, what, what is the path forward? Um, and so those are months conversations. We made that from two weeks to six months. It, it aligns with the hospice regulations in the United States of six months. It's Again, it's somewhat arbitrary, but it's trying to kind of get a sense of the different kinds of conversations patients might have. And then the ones before that, six months and on, are years. And I think of that is probably more like the typical advanced care planning conversation where you're still well, but you're kind of thinking ahead about what might happen. And what's interesting about this data is only 4% of patients had all three. So it's uncommon. But one of the things we're going to be working on is trying to think about, is this framework a way to measure quality, right? Because maybe you don't, many of these patients have three or four conversations, and maybe that's less meaningful than making sure you at least have one at the month's time frame, at least have one at the day's time frame, um, and then trying to see kind of what happens when we have these series of conversations with patients and families. Do those patients have better outcomes? Okay, so I'm gonna end it there. Thank you, um, Juliet. That was um, really very interesting and um, also dovetailed really nicely with um, Sean's conversation um, presentation as well. Um, I think um, Jim, I think Jim Clear is um, with us and has got a, a question in the um, chat. I don't know, Jim, whether you want to hop on and ask that question. Um, be nice. Have we still got Jim with us? He's with us, but he's not hearing us. So um, to go back to the chat. So Jim's point was really um, about the role of advanced care planning in early palliative care consults um, versus um, palliative care consults at the end of life. And some of these times we, we put these metrics in that advanced care planning uh, as a metric for early palliative care consults. Um, um, what are your thoughts on that, Sean? You're muted, Sean. Oh, yep, you... No, I got it. I just got finding it, it off. Yeah. Um, I think there are three thoughts around that. I think, first of all, what has happened is that documentation of advanced care planning has become in many ways a checkbox quality metric that it's did it exist did it not exist and if it did that's good quality care and i think what that excludes is that we know that what's most important is the quality of that conversation so when that conversation happens by a palliative care clinician um, i can be quite convinced that it's going to be a high quality conversation because to get to that level of specialty, you need to have had appropriate training in core communication skills. However, I also know that the average primary care physician has never had those communication training. And I know from the data, particularly from Bob Arnold and James Tolsky, that those conversations tend to be a very low quality. And in fact, patients leave them with very different perceptions 
of what actually happened and the decisions made than their physician did. So that for Jim's question, yes, I think an early discussion about goals of care with a palliative care team is a marker of quality. I think that the presence of an advanced care planning discussion with any clinician is probably a not, not a good marker of quality. And I would suggest that a conversation about future goals, wishes, and hypothetical scenarios with a healthy person like, for hopefully, me um, really is not a measure of good quality medical care because I would rather my physician be spending my limited office visit time focusing on something else that I know is more relevant. Thanks, and I, and I, I think that the, 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 there's a thread coming through the chat here about the, the, the reductionist to a completing a document um, is not the best way to promote um, conversations and shared decision making. Um, and it, it seems to me that, you know, advanced care planning um, in its widest conception is exactly about promoting conversations and shared decision makings and goal concordance. But by the time it's taken through a healthcare system, it ends up being when 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 we think somebody's got six months to live, make sure they fill this document in. Um, and the person doing it has none of the appropriate training or qualities to do that. And then then that's when you you lead into that sense of doing harm. Um, and I I think really what Juliet, you were kind of and I think Sean in the chat there, almost thinking of the paradigm and, and the and the language we use around this, I think I think still isn't isn't that clear. And I think one of the things that you said, Juliet, was about the, and I know it's part of the serious illness kind of language about meaningful conversations of high quality. And I think sometimes we have to be, I think we have to be careful with our consultant colleagues because if you go, we're now going to, we're now going to enable you to have a meaningful conversation of high quality. It's like, what, what are we doing anyway? <laughs> and it, I, I, I think some of this language is very important about how we how we put this aside along alongside the normal consultation. I don't know, Julia, have you any more thoughts about that? Well, it's so, I mean, it's, it's so tricky because even within um, the Ariadne program, those questions, what's your understanding of your health? What's your understanding of your illness? Like it, it can take you on two pathways and you could have a conversation using that same script about what you would want if you were sick and if you were dying or about what your priorities are now and how do you want to live and what's important to you now. And I don't even think we have training consistency in our own approach of like which conversation people get. And I think to some degree, it's the clinician's skill and they're kind of um, in some ways reacting to the patient, right? So when patients want to talk about end of life and cue that they're comfortable with that, you're more likely to go down that path. When patients don't, you are more likely to stay at this more positive frame. <laughs> but it gets to this question of, of what are we doing, right? And what's actually even therapeutic? Um, and what is even the serious illness conversation? Does it have to imagine the future health states or can it just be about, gosh, we know time is limited because you have this cancer now. How do you want to spend it? And how can we help you the best in this time right now, right? And those are, those are just different conversations. Yeah, I think um, I think that, that that developing the language around this, and Sean, you put something in the chat about this. Maybe you, could you want to expand a little bit more about this, the language, and what what you've obviously, obviously done a lot of thinking about this. How would you see that construct um, working? And and people are kind of also in the chat talking about. These, these conversations, as Julie was saying, maybe at six months are quite different, you know, one week from death. And how, how, how what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the challenge for us, if we can't agree on what is a definition of advanced care planning, um, what does that mean for the public we're trying to communicate with? And I think, you know, this idea that the conversation changes as the time during serious illness changes um, it's really important because I would never say we shouldn't be talking, not be talking with people with serious illness about their values, goals, and preferences and how we can align 
our treatments with them. And that is an ongoing process, but it's a real-time process. It has real time. When you go and ask the average person in the street, what is advanced care planning, you know, the overwhelming majority will say, well, it's a living will, and I have or don't have that one. And that's where the public is on this. And if we continue to say and to propagate, you know, we want to do advanced care planning, the public has a very clear idea about what that is. And our colleagues have a very clear idea about what that is. And it's not what we're proposing. And so that's why I've sort of come to this idea that we really need a paradigm shift. We need to change our language. And our focus really should be on targeting those who are really living with a serious illness now, not those who are healthy, not those who are living with chronic conditions, and really focus on those real-time decisions that have real-time implications. And I think we do our patients and our families a disservice when we talk about that or we group that as advanced care planning. Because we have worked so hard, at least from 1990 to 2000 and on, to define advanced care planning as something different. And I think we are just confusing our message right now when we start sort of lumping all of this together. Yeah, Juliet, do you want to come in? Um, maybe we'll, we'll leave that there. My, my thought flew my head. <laughs> I mean, it'll come back. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, that when you talk about values, goals, and preferences, I think, um, I think it's almost how we, how we promote that inclusion, um, in conversations people are having. So that's not to say that you're not having good conversations or important ones, but, actually the renal physician with the dialysis patient, have you had a conversation with your patient about values, goals, and preferences? And in general, the answer will be no. And we're doing some work in Liverpool with our renal physicians at the moment. And, um, and I think it's fair to say that those, those patients that are offered a conversation along, along the serious illness conversation guide, I think, I think my, my metric is, have you, have you offered people this conversation? Because some people really maybe don't even want this conversation, which is fair enough. But if you've offered it and people have this conversation with their consultant, I mean, the outcomes seem really very positive from the patient. And, and I think giving them, it also gives them that permission to have a conversation about their values, goals and preferences with their consultant or their healthcare team moving forward. So I think that's, to me, that seems to me a critical point to say, do you want this kind of conversation? If you do, that then gives the patient not, not just that conversation, but, for the, but for the permission to continuing that conversation about values, values, goals and preferences as their disease progresses and their life progresses. And I think that seems to be the, a very important focus of what we should be talking about. And that may or may not involve advanced care planning and documentation in that area, but it may well not. And I think that for me is perhaps more the paradigm we should be promoting and discussing. Um, I think just to add, John, I think sometimes some of the confusion comes from, it's not really values, goals and preferences about anything. The meaning comes because you have a serious illness, because time is limited, because there's this thing that's gonna happen in the future, even if we don't anticipate decision-making at that moment, it's that it's, it's, it's the presence of the possibility of dying that kind of grounds the conversation. And so I think that's why the language keeps kind of, why we kind of get sucked back into the advanced care planning realm, because that is also kind of grounded on this event of dying, right? And so there, in some ways, both conversations have meaning be, because they're anchoring at this place, even though we don't, we don't really want to be thinking about the decisions at that moment. We, we've done a lot of research on that and it's not helpful. We want to be thinking about how to live now. And yet there's a relationship to the end, I think, that's confusing. Yeah, and, I, and I think to put a distinctly American perspective on this, it is the difference between having the conversation with death when death is hypothetical versus when death is very real and expected. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um. Okay, I think um, we will be concluding on time and just, just a few um, concluding slides, but I think that's been um, very much uh, a fascinating conversation. And again, a big thank you to Juliet and Sean for joining us today. Um, 
for the, the members that are with us from the International Collaborative, this will be um, on the members website so you can share it with their teams. I think it's, some, it's a, a webinar I think we'll be sharing locally um, with the wider team in Liverpool because I think it does really resonate with our work and some of the current conversations we're having about the issues around um, um, conversations and advanced care planning. So thank you both very much once again for your time and sharing with us your expertise today. Um, just to finish, I hope you can see that slide and it won't move. My, um, my computer's not be behaving today, so I shall just do it um, orally. So just thanks once again for all the members. For non-members, please do go to our website. You'll find it if you just Google best care for the dying patient. You'll find out how you can join and participate in our events, including the webinars. We have our summer school, um, which we're quite excited about, which is coming along in May. Um, one of our parallel work streams is going to be around the Serious Illness Care program. Um, we look forward to welcoming a number of you on the webinar today to take that, that work forward. And certainly the conversations today, I think, will also influence how we um, frame that and think about how we move that programme forward. Um, we also have our annual symposium, which is to, um, taking place in Liverpool this year with an annual conference, which, again, you're all welcome to. And details of that are back on the website. Um, our, our next um, um, webinar is again available and um, the dates on the website and I think um, we look forward to welcoming you as many of you as possible to the webinar. Uh, thank you all for your attendance and uh, wish you well for the rest of the day. Bye bye for now. Bye bye. Thank you once again. Thank you.